I, I told the camera earlier uh, before everyone got here, there's no way they're going to keep me on camera today. Uh, I, I'm going to teach, uh, I'm, I'm going to preach, I'm going to teach how I do in class. I carry my iPad around and uh, uh, just walking. Um, I have a lot of nervous energy uh, this morning, uh, so if I just stand up there, I'll, I'll almost be dancing up there. So I, I got to continue to pace to uh, get the nervous energy out. Um, but I want you to think of something, and, and then I'll have you share with each other what your thoughts are. So I, yeah, I'm going to let you talk in church a little bit here today. But I want you to think, what is your favorite time of the year? Maybe your favorite day of the year, maybe favorite couple days of the year. What is your favorite day or time of the year? Okay. Summer. You know, at the age of 70, when I open my eyes in the morning. <laughs> every day, every day we wake up is our favorite day. Easter Sunday. I, I love sunrise service here. The fall. Seeing colors change in the falls. Growing up in North Carolina, uh, we never saw the colors change. I didn't know anything about colors changing until we moved up here. I didn't know anything about snow either. Oof. <laughs> Anyone else? I like spring with the rebirth of the flowers and the buds and so on. Yep, spring. Uh, you know, I was expecting people to say Christmas, you know, uh, the time right around the holidays, enjoying time with family. Please don't take what I'm about to say the wrong way or look down on me, but my favorite time of the year is today, is one of my favorite days of the year. And it's not, you did. And it's not because of St. Patrick's Day. It is not because of St. Patrick's Day. Today is one of my favorite days of the year, and then Thursday and Friday. Now make it plain. Now make it plain. Make it plain. March Madness. NCAA basketball, college basketball. I cannot wait till tonight at 6 o'clock when the brackets are released. I will sit on my couch, I'll have my blank bracket, and I'll fill it out. And, and it's a great time of the year. And then Thursday and Friday is the first round of the, the tournament. And I've had the joy twice to be able to go down to Raleigh, North Carolina, and watch the first two rounds of the NCAA basketball tournament. It was fantastic. Both times we were about 10 rows off the court, and we were watching there. We watched six games in two days. I mean, it was nonstop basketball. And being that we were watching the games in North Carolina, they normally keep the local teams there at that arena. So we would always see Duke. I'm not a Duke fan. We'd always see Carolina. I know Pastor Lee loves UNC. You guys know I don't. Uh, <laughs> So we'd see all those schools, and they would play other schools, and Duke and Carolina were always like the top seeds, so they would play some of the lesser teams. And in the arena, you had your couple, you had your Duke fans, you had your Carolina fans, what other, other schools were there, you had their fans, but over half the arena was people like me that just love college basketball. So who do I root for? I'll tell you this, I don't root for Duke or Carolina. <laughs> I root for the little guy. I root for the underdog. Last time we went down, Duke played Mercer. If any of you remember, Duke played Mercer, and Mercer was hanging around. Mercer was a 14 seed. They were one of the last teams to get into the tournament. And Duke, number three seed, one of the top teams. And Mercer hung around. And at halftime, you could feel the buzz in the arena. Just maybe, just maybe they could pull off this upset. And they did. That arena was electric. You know, all the Duke fans were upset, but everyone else, it was electric. And why? Everybody loves an underdog. Everybody loves an underdog. This past year, for the first time ever, a 16 seed beat a one seed, University of Maryland, Baltimore County. 
Who knew? Beat Virginia. Everyone loves an underdog. Everyone loves underdog stories. They're all over sports. Probably the most famous underdog story, Lake Placid, 1980. USA defeated USSR in ice hockey. Now, most people don't remember that actually was not the gold medal game. That was the semifinal game to get to the gold medal game, but no one gave USA a chance. That's a true underdog story. We like to go see movies that are involved with underdogs. Rocky, little guy from Philadelphia. Rudy, I don't know if you've seen Rudy or not. Little kid walks onto the team at Notre Dame. He just wants to buff the helmets. That's where he starts off at. And then his last game, they allow him to dress up. And they put him in the game. One of my favorite movies, the best basketball movie of all time, Hoosers. Little town from Indiana. French Lick, Indiana, I think it was. Uh, went on and won the state championship. Everyone loves an underdog story. And you know the Bible's full of underdogs? And when you think of the underdogs in the Bible, you know, David versus Goliath. It's such a big under, underdog that when they talk of NCAA basketball, they always talk about the David versus Goliaths. I can almost guarantee you tonight at 6 o'clock when the brackets are released, they will say, oh, this is a David versus Goliath matchup. Pastor Lee last week uh, talked to the little kids about David versus Goliath. He read them a story about it. Joseph versus the Pharaoh. Joseph was amazing. He was so low and then went to great power and then crashed again and back up. and oh, It was all over the park, all over the place. Actually, that's Moses versus the Pharaoh. Uh, Joseph versus the Pharaoh also. Uh, my wife told me Esther, great underdog story. Samuel, Jesus himself was an underdog. So what I did to get prepared for this, I searched on the internet for underdog stories in the Bible. And everyone that I've said so far was there. And then there was this one. I've heard the name before. Gideon. I had no clue what the story was about. All I know about Gideon is that they put Bibles in hotel rooms. That's what I know about Gideon International. Every hotel room you go to, you, you open up the dresser drawer, and there's a Bible there from Gideon International. That's all I knew about the Gideons. So I started reading. And I'm not going to read you all of chapter 6 and chapter 7, and really chapter 8 and chapter 9 about Gideon. That would take us 25 minutes. And someone said, they hope I don't do that. <laughs> So uh, we're, we're, we're just going to read parts of it. Um, let me get in my notes where I'm at here. Now, I do need to apologize. Uh, Judges is in the Old Testament. There are a lot of words, pronunciations, that I don't know how to say as we read through this. I'm going to do my best. Please, nobody call in the 30 seconds and complain about it. I've been in 30 seconds enough. I don't need more uh, from church being in 30 seconds. Uh, so giving you some backstory to get up to the point where we'll start looking at the Bible. This occurred after Moses delivered the people out of Egypt, delivered the Israelites out of Egypt. Uh, Moses delivered them out and life was good. They were, they were worshiping only the true God. And time went on. But as time went on, they started, yeah, they were worshiping God, but they were also worshiping Baal. And God looked down and said, I'm not happy with this. And after a couple generations, uh, he had the Mendonites sort of go in and harm the Israelites. 
the Mennonites would take their crops, their livestock. The Bible says they swarmed them like locusts. They invaded the land and ravaged it. The Bible says that the Medians so impoverished the Israelites that they cried out to the Lord for help. So first off, Judges chapter 6. I'm actually going to start at verse 6. The Mennonites took almost everything that belonged to the Israelites, and the Israelites begged the Lord for help. Then the Lord sent a prophet to them with this message. I am the Lord God of Israel. So listen to what I say. You are slaves in Egypt, but I set you free and led you out of Egypt into this land. And when the nations were made, and when nations here made life miserable for you, I rescued you and helped you get rid of them and take their land. I am your God, and I told you not to worship Amorite gods, even though you are living in the land of the Amorites, but you refused to listen. One day, an angel from the Lord went to the town of Ophrah and sat down under the big tree that belonged to Joaz, a member of the Abizir clan. Joaz's son Gideon was nearby, threshing grain in a shallow pit where he could not be seen by the Midianites. The angel appeared and spoke to Gideon, the Lord is helping you and you are a strong warrior. Gideon answered, please don't take this wrong. But if the Lord is helping us, why then have all of these awful things happened? We've heard how the Lord performed miracles and rescued our ancestors from Egypt, but those things happened long ago. Now the Lord has abandoned us to the Mennonites. Now think of the situation here. Gideon, whose land has just been invaded, everything has been taken from him, They're crying out, please help us. The Lord sends an angel down and says, you know, why are you doing what you're doing? He he, he sits there and he calls him a mighty warrior. A strong warrior is what I read. He's, He's just trying to make do. He's working in his fields, hoping the Mennonites don't come and take what he has grown. And this angel is calling him a great warrior. Personally, I I can't imagine someone coming down after all the hardships we've been through and told me I'm a great warrior. This is a little man. This is one person. Then the Lord himself said, Gideon, you will be strong. Because I am giving you the power to rescue Israel from the Mennonites. Gideon replied, but how can I rescue Israel? My clan is the weakest one in Messiah. And everyone else in my family is more important than I am. Gideon is an underdog. His clan is the weakest. And he is the least important person in his family. He's a true underdog. Gideon, the Lord answered, you can rescue Israel because I am going to help you. Defeating the Midianites will be as easy as beating up one man. Lord saying, I'm there with you. Last time I preached, I think I said, I got your back. That's what the Lord's saying here. I got your back. I know you're the underdog. I know you're a one lowly person, but I can help you. But then this is where the story, if you read through this chapter, takes real strange twists. It's almost like Gideon is testing the Lord, and the Lord is testing Gideon back and forth. It's very strange. Gideon goes to the angel, you know, if you truly are this, this, the angel of the Lord, I need you to prove to me that you are who you say you are. So he gathered a bunch of things together and offered an offering. He put it on a stone and said, if you truly are this person, let me see something magical happen. And all of a sudden, fire. The offering went up in flames. And Gideon was, ooh, maybe, maybe. 
So then the Lord then tested Gideon. He's like, well, let me see you do something for me before we try to take this land back. He goes, in the center of your town is a statue, an altar to Baal. Your father actually built this. I want you to go and tear it down. And at the same time, I want you to build an altar to me. I want, to take, I want you to take your father's best bull, amazing, <laughs> take your father's best bull and offer it at the altar. Now Gideon, he's like, okay, I'll do this, but I'm going to do it in the middle of the night because he doesn't want anyone to know that he's doing this. He takes 10 of his best friends and they go and they tear down the altar, the altar to Baal. They build up another one. He takes his father's bull and he sacrifices it in the middle of the night so that no one knows it's him. But you know as much as I know, if something happens, someone's going to find out. If something happens in school, normally we can find out who did what in school. Same thing here. The town folk woke up and looked at the center of town, saw the statue torn down, saw the new altar built up, and asked, what went on here? And they questioned, and it came out that, you know, that Gideon did this. So they went to Gideon's father and said, Gideon must be put to death, because he has wronged Baal. And Gideon's father said, no, we're not going to. If Baal is as strong as you people believe he is, then Baal can punish him. And this was like a changing moment in this chapter of the Bible. A changing moment from people worshiping Baal to saying, you know what? Maybe God is all-powerful. So then what takes place is that Gideon starts to become stronger. You know, he had his 10 friends with him. But to go against the Mennonite army who had 130,000 people, he had to build his own army. And they started talking to the people in the town. They started talking to people in towns around them. And they all came together. And in that time... He encompassed an army of 32,000 men. Now, 130,000, 32,000, he's still an underdog. It's still not good odds for him. But he does have a large army. Going to chapter 7, verse 1. Early the next morning, Gideon and his army got up and moved their camp to Fear Spring. The Mennonites' camp was to the north in the valley of the foot of Mora Hill. The Lord said, Gideon, your army is too big. I can't let you win this with, with this many soldiers. The Israelites would think that, the, that they had won the battle all by themselves and that I didn't have anything to do with it. So call your troops together and tell them that anyone who is really afraid can leave Mount Gilead and go home. 22,000 men returned home, leaving Gideon only 10,000 soldiers. So Gideon had got an army of 32,000, and he thought, man, maybe we can take on this other army. And God goes, no, that is too big. If you defeat that army with your 32,000, people will think that the army won the battle, that I had nothing to do with it. I need these people to understand that I am the Lord. I am the most powerful. So he said, get rid of 22,000 people. Those people that are afraid to fight, let them go back home. And you have 10,000 now. He's now even a bigger underdog. But it gets worse. Gideon, the Lord said, you still have too many soldiers. Take them down to the spring and I'll test them. I'll tell you which ones can go along with you and which ones must go back home. 
When Gideon led his army down to the spring, the Lord told him, Watch how each man gets a drink of water, then divide them into two groups, those who lap the water like a dog and those who kneel down to drink. Three hundred men scooped up water in their hands and lapped it, and the rest knelt to drink. The Lord said, Gideon, your army will be made up of everyone who lapped the water from their hands. Send the others home. I'm going to rescue Israel by helping you and your army of 300 defeat the Mennonites. 32,000, down to 10,000, down to 300. What just happened here is like what can happen in a game as, as sports. Start off really low. The momentum, you get a high momentum, you get up to 32,000 people, and then you're trashed back down. And sports do this all the time. But this is what happened to Gideon. <laughs> I've written in here in my notes. I don't think Vegas would put very good odds on Gideon and his army right now. 300 people compared to 130,000. It was 450 to 1. But the chapter goes on in the next chapter where Gideon's army did win. And actually, they didn't even have to go into battle. But that's for another sermon for another time. So what does this have to do with us? What does this understand? underdog story have to do with you and me? I would say that as Christians, we're underdogs. It is tough being a Christian. You have a choice every day. You have many choices every day. Today, for example, you could have stayed in bed. You could have stayed home watch TV, that's the easy thing to do. Hard thing to do is to get up on a day off and come into church and listen. You have the opportunity to sit around the water cooler at work or with friends and gossip. Gossiping is the easy thing to do. The hard thing to do is to step up and say, you know what, this isn't right. Being a Christian is not easy. When someone does you wrong, when someone harms you, the easy thing is to do harm back to them. But that's not what the Bible wants us to do. That's not what means being a good Christian. Turn the other cheek. That's the hard thing to do. We are all underdogs here. But the great thing is, we're all underdogs together. We have each other's back. I like to think of this, putting this into the sports metaphor, as Jesus, God, sitting up there in the rafters of what we're doing and looking down on us and cheering for us, just like each one of us cheers for each other. And then as I was thinking about this more yesterday, God is always with us. Gideon went from 32,000 people down to 10,000 people down to 300 people. He could have put up his arms and said, I quit. But no, he had faith in the Lord. He had faith in the Lord that the Lord would save them. I don't know what your situations are. But I know sometimes that we think we're beaten down. And then it seems like the Lord throws something else at us. And we get beat down even more. And we could throw up our hands and say, I quit. But please, the Lord is with you. The Lord is there to help you through these difficult situations. He is there to save us. He is a fantastic God. No matter what your situation is, no matter how beat down you are, trust in the Lord. He is fantastic. 
my son wears a necklace. We actually just got it fixed yesterday. It has a quote. Uh, if you ask him about it, he can tell you without hesitation what's on it. I'm not going to put him on the spot right now to do that. Uh, but it's Philippians 4.13. We can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Please, I look at God as the person looked down at us. He's proud of us all the time, no matter what situations he puts you in. We are the underdogs, but he will help us pull through. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for being there with us. We want to thank you for looking down on us. I know that we are in some difficult situations, but you put us there for a reason. Because you can guide us through this. We love you. Everything that you do for us is fantastic. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.